Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm excited to introduce this week's speaker. We have Dr. Nadine Igonin. Um, Nadine is an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. She's a seismologist that specializes in injection-induced seismicity. Nadine got her bachelor's and PhD at the University of Calgary in Canada, uh, where she was looking at hydraulic fracturing-induced seismicity in Alberta and British Columbia areas. Nadine continued her research at the UT at Austin, where she was a postdoc fellow for two years, working both with faculty at the Department of Geoscience and with the, uh, the TexNet consortium. Today, Nadine will be talking to us about earthquake statistics and attributes across Texas. And whenever you're ready, uh, please begin, Nadine. Wonderful. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, it's great to be back at, at the BG. Um, so that's right. I spent about a year at the Bureau uh, working with TexNet. And then the work that I will be showing here is the result of uh, work that I've been doing both with TexNet and Scissor. Um, so, all right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So what we're going to cover is we, we're going to, the, the talk is going to have two parts. We're going to have a part on the statistical analysis of the earthquakes across Texas. And then we are also going to uh, have a focus area looking at West Texas only. Um, all right, so uh, the motivation. So why we decided the reason we decided to carry out this research is that we noticed that there's significant there are significant differences in the seismogenic response to injection across basins, right? So for example, the Haynesville is not associated with all that much seismicity, whereas the Delaware Basin, of course, is really now has become quite famous for um, so several larger magnitude events and a lot of seismic activity. So we wanted to understand the variability from basin to basin. Um, this is the workflow that we used. Um, first, we tried to get as much data as we possibly could. So that's this combined catalog step. Then we did a clustering analysis to get individual fault strands uh, and, and look at individual fault systems separately so that we could do some more detailed analysis. And that will have two parts. So we'll talk about B values um, and then this sort of exceedance probability parameter, which is a form of risk assessment. Um, and then we will also look at time series analysis using these clusters. So there's quite a lot of data that's available in, in Texas. And so there's some public catalogs, of course, with TexNet being the cornerstone. Uh, we have some uh, catalogs that have been shared with us or uh, derived uh, within the group or within other groups. And then there is also a lot of literature that has been published with where people have gone through and tried to enhance catalogs in different regions. So, for example, in the Eagleford or the Haynesville, et cetera. Um, and so we combined all of these catalogs, removed duplicate events, um, and this is what we end up with <clears throat> in the end. So we have uh, catalogs that span uh, all like the six major basins in Texas um, into a comprehensive catalog, and we have th tens of thousands of events. Um, right, and then just to summarize, the six major basins are the, the DFW area, so that's where that's where I am currently. Uh, we have the Delaware Basin in West Texas. We have the Eagleford South of San Antonio. We have the Haynesville in East Texas, uh, Midland, of course, over here, and then the Panhandle uh, to the north. And so these regions are mainly induced seismicity, but for example, in the Panhandle, and then in parts of the Delaware Basin, we have natural seismicity as well. So in terms of the time series analysis, um, it's probably not a surprise to any of you that Texas uh, that seismicity in Texas has been present since uh, the 1920s, if not earlier. Um, however, the the reason the reason that we're carrying out this research is the sort of more recent acceleration of seismicity in the Midland, Delaware, and Eagleford regions. And so you can see that on the y-axis we're in a log scale, and yet even in the log scale we can see this sort of accelerating trend. Um, and so going forward, uh, for the remainder of the talk, I'll mainly be focusing on uh, Midland, Delaware, and the Eagle Fur, because these are our three current sort of most active regions. Um, so for the clustering analysis, we used a relatively simple algorithm. Uh, it's, it's called dbscan. It's a density-based algorithm, and so it uses the distances between points in order to cluster them. And so if you tune the parameters just right, actually it works quite well. Um, the inputs are also very simple. It's just latitude and longitude. 
Um, so because the because the lengths of the catalogs that we're using are so long, like going back to the 1920s, for example, the there's no reliable depth, right, for for like certain chunks of the of the catalogs, um, and so depth can't be used, for example. And then if you use time, then it starts to bias the way that the clusters form. So that's why we used only latitude and longitude. Um, and so here's an example in a subregion um, in the Delaware Basin of sort of how this algorithm works. And so um, here you can see that I have, you know, 17 clusters um, in this little subregion. Um, in map view, they, they tend to separate out quite nicely. Um, and then in time series view, you can also see that even though we didn't cluster in time, um, there's some nice correlations, right? So sometimes certain clusters are only active at certain times. Other clusters are sort of active uh, more on a longer time scale. Um, and so we went through and we did this for all of the basins in Texas. And what we got is we got about 527 uh, individual clusters. Um, and so the most bountiful regions, of course, are the Delaware Basin, uh, the Eagleford, and uh, the Midland Basin. Um, and so then we went through and we wanted to look at each of these clusters individually and do some more detailed statistical analysis, right? And so one of the things that seismologists use are magnitude frequency distributions. And so a magnitude frequency distribution is really just what you see here. It's magnitude on the x-axis and then the number of events in log scale on the y-axis. And there's a very simple relationship between the slope of the cumulative uh, uh, magnitude distribution um, and, and so the slope basically is, is this something that's called the B value. Um, and so this comes from the Gutenberg-Richter relationship. And the B value really gives you an idea for uh, whether a region is higher risk or lower risk. So typically, uh, we expect B values of approximately one for, for natural tectonic earthquakes. Um, if a region has a really low B value, like 0 0.7, 0 0.6, um, then there is a higher risk of a large magnitude earthquake, right? So you can imagine the slope goes down and then therefore you can get more earthquakes in this end on the upper end. Um, whereas the higher B values typically are uh, associated with uh, lower risk. So we went through, we calculated B values for all 527, well, as many of the clusters as we could. Um, and so I've sort of plotted these distributions of the, hist uh, I've plotted these distributions of the, uh, of the B values. And so the, the means tend to be around one, which is good, um, but there is some spread. So for example, in the Delaware Basin, the B values range all the way from 0 0.5 to 1.5, right? So that, that spans the whole range basically. Um, and so in general, the Delaware has the highest average B value, while the Midland Basin has, of the three largest basins, the Midland has the lowest average B value. So we wanted to go further um, and so one of the things to note is that B values are not static, right? So kind of here I have them plotted as each cluster has its own B value. But really, when you look at some of these clusters in more depth, they change over time. So for example, the most uh, recent magnitude 5.2 earthquake um, was in the Colson sequence in West Texas. Um, and so if I plot all the earthquakes in that cluster, um, all the way up until November 2023, what I see, so the white dashed line is the B value. What I see is that the B values really change quite a bit over the years. Um, and so we have periods where the B values drop and then they kind of recover and then they drop and then they recover, but we sort of have this, this sort of continual dropping. Um, and then we have this sort of inter, inter sequence healing of some kind, right? And so um, the thing is more work needs to be done to understand what is driving this. So bear in mind, this is a simplification that we've made. We assume each cluster has its own uh, individual B value, but in fact, uh, B values are not static. Um, so uh, the B value alone often is not quite enough to quantify risk. And so uh, there's this, this parameter called the exceedance probability um, that, is, that is used uh, used for this purpose. So it's the probability of an earthquake of a given magnitude based on the B value, the magnitude of completeness. So that is the, the lowest magnitude at which you feel you've captured all of the events um, and the number of events recorded so far, um, all of which can be taken from a magnitude frequency distribution. 
Um, and so basically it's a measure of how likely an earthquake is uh, based on avail available data. So I've plotted an example exceedance probability curve here on the right with a B value of one, Mantu completeness of one, and 100 events. And the way that this works is you say, okay, we want to know what is the probability of a magnitude four event given these parameters. Well, you just read it off at the crosshairs. Um, there's about an 8.5% chance of a magnitude four event, right? Uh, likewise, there's a 94% chance of a magnitude 2.5 event, right? Given these parameters. Um, and so you can go through and you can calculate uh, this exceedance probability um, for each cluster. And so let's go through an example of how we did this step-by-step. -step. So um, another famous cluster in the West Delaware Basin is the Mentone cluster, um, which hosted a magnitude 4.9 event a few years ago um, in 2020. And so here's the time series of the events. Here's the map view. It's one or two sort of uh, sublinear features. Um, and so for this, we can we can we use all the earthquakes before the largest event, right? So before that magnitude 4.9, there were 67 events before the largest event with a B value of about 0 0.9, and this is our magnitude of completeness. So this is our magnitude frequency distribution. We use this to feed into the exceedance probability calculation, right? And then we see, okay, what was the probability of that magnitude 4.9 earthquake happening given all the earthquakes and the prior information for that big earthquake, right? So in this case, it's a pretty low probability, right? So this was a low probability earthquake, meaning um, it was not statistically expected based on the Gutenberg-Richter relationship. Um, and so we can go through and we can do this analysis for all of the clusters for which we have B values, magnitude of completeness, et cetera. Um, and so, yeah, we did this for each cluster. Um, and the way that, like, to visualize it, right? So we're heading towards map views, right? The goal is to analyze if there's any spatial trends, right? Um, but in order to get there, we have this sort of, uh, we developed this risk matrix approach. And so on the y-axis, I have exceedance probability, right? So it can be high or low. Um, and then on the x-axis, I have the number of events. Um, and so Mentone, based on our analysis in the last couple of slides, um, Mentone fits right here. So uh, in total, it had a couple hundred events in the sequence, but it had a really low exceedance probability, so it plots in this quadrant. Um, and so uh, we have these four uh, we have these four quadrants. If if the number of events is small and the exceedance probability is small, um, that is a very high risk type of sequence. It means that it came out out of nowhere, so there's very few events, and it produced a statistically unexpected earthquake, right? So that that's that low exceedance probability. Um, whereas if we have for example, many events, but they were all statistically expected, that's just a low risk, but productive sequence. And so we went through, we uh, calculated these attributes for all, you know, all 500 clusters. Um, and what you see really is a relatively uniform distribution of exceedance probabilities across the basin. So we have, we do have quite a few low exceedance probability clusters, um, but also, you know, a really good number of high exceedance probability clusters. Um, across the basin. Um, and again, here they are classified by this sort of uh, uh, risk matrix approach. And so the reason we've now have things separated in a risk matrix is to see if we can identify any trends in the map view, right? So are there any regions that are more prone to this sort of high risk and unproductive behavior or high risk and productive or this sort of safer, low risk and productive or unproductive sort of uh, behavior? Um, and so, uh, in Southern Delaware, so yeah, so here I've plotted the, uh, map views of the clusters of the seismicity, um, colored by where they are in that risk matrix plot. So the red and the yellow, those are the ones that we don't want, right? So we want to understand regions where we have these low exceedance events. Um, and so one of the things that jumps out is the Southern Delaware basin right here, right? So it has a high proportion of the high risk low productivity uh, sequences. Um, there's some correlation between uh, the location of these um, these earthquake clusters and where there is more hydraulic fracturing going on. So there's sort of a, a weak correlation there. 
Um, whereas in the Midland Basin, there it's it's not really the red, right? So it's not the low exceedance, low prob prob productivity, but it's more of the low exceedance, high productivity that we see there. Um, but West Delaware also has um, a decent number of these low exceedance, low probability uh, clusters. So that's these guys over here, um, especially towards the basin edges, which is quite interesting. Uh, we'll take a closer look at that later. Um, Eagleford, if we jump down to the Eagleford south of San Antonio, um, we see the really the dominant colors are red, black, and green, right? So they're not really seeing this the yellow, right? So they're not seeing the low exceedance high probability. Um, and so one of the reasons I think that that happens is that the Eagleford is is known to be dominated by hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity. And so that's kind of what's being shown here with the red. Um, these, these red points are uh, areas where it's like it is very likely that the earthquakes are due to hydraulic fracturing. Um, so in other words, the correlation is if there's a region with more hydraulic fracturing, it's more likely to produce short-lived sudden bursts of seismicity, right? Which makes sense because hydraulic fracturing in its nature is short-lived and at very high pressure, right? So that's, that's not entirely unintuitive. Um, and so, okay, we finished looking at what the magnitude frequency distributions can tell us about the risks and the relationships to the style of injection. Um, but we can also look at the time series analysis, which will be the next step. So what we found as we were going through all of these different clusters, we found that there's this sort of uh, binary um, uh, of, of really two dominant cluster categories. So we have clusters that are quite episodic in nature. So they have series of, of bursts of events that have a sudden onset and end, such as this one here, right? So you can see, and then there's sort of these quiescent gaps in between. Um, and then the other end member, is uh, diffuse seismicity, uh, which is more or less continuous seismicity of various magnitudes. So for example, here during this time period, this particular cluster for a year exhibits diffuse seismicity, right? So there, there's no clear start stop. It's just kind of continually rumbling along um, over the period of about a year. And so we went through, we classified, again, those 527 clusters, um, uh, based on whether they were episodic or diffuse. Um, and we found some really interesting trends. And so, for example, um, the, the Delaware Basin is about 50%, you know, well, not, not 50%, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a good mixture of diffuse and episodic, whereas Eagleford leans very dominantly towards episodic. Again, this makes sense, given Eagleford is dominantly hydraulic fracturing induced seismicity. Um, the Midland Basin also jumps out. Most of the clusters in the Midland Basin are diffuse, right? And so uh, this also makes sense because the current, at least the current state of knowledge, is that most of the seismicity in the Midland Basin is due to uh, deep wastewater injection, right? Not hydraulic fracturing. And so um, what we're starting to see here is that the different injection styles produce different uh, uh, types of seismicity with different risks and also uh, with different, you know, time series characteristics. Um, in the DFW area, it's mainly episodic. Um, the panhandle is a mixture of diffuse and episodic. And then the pan the Haynesville region is also sort of uh, like a, a mixture, but there's really not enough earthquakes to know for sure uh, which way that basin is trending. Um, so really, again, there's a, in map view especially, there's a striking difference between the Delaware Basin, right? So this mixture of, of green and orange, the episodic and diffuse, and the Midland Basin, which is just, just about entirely uh, diffuse, right? Um, and again, in my mind, this really just comes down to the injection style. Um, Eagleford, again, dominantly green. Um, the few areas where it is the diffuse seismicity, those are regions where different authors have found that wastewater injection in those regions, in fact, is the, um, is the cause of seismicity. So again, the, the diffuse clusters correlate with regions of wastewater injection. Um, so in South Delaware, uh, again, we have this sort of, we have both, right, with both episodic and diffuse. Um, but what's interesting is that, uh, yeah, yeah, so there's there's a mixture of both. But what's interesting is, in fact, in the West Delaware Basin. So in the West Delaware Basin, there is virtually no 
hydraulic fracturing, right? So this this is where things get interesting. Um, so we cannot say, especially especially all the way out on the on this western margin of the West Delaware Basin, there is no hydraulic fracturing activity of any kind. Um, and so now the question becomes, why are these sequences green? Why are they episodic when they are not related to hydraulic fracturing, right? Um, and so I think now here we can get a really interesting view about the uh, the stress state and really understanding what's going on in West in in the West Delaware Basin that's making it first of all produce relatively high magnitude events, um, and second of all that that it produces events that are uh, uh, burst like um, and episodic as opposed to diffuse. Um, so yeah, so I think from a seismological perspective here, we can dig in and learn something really quite interesting. Um, now, if we link our time series analysis and our exceedance probability analysis, um, one of the things we find is that the episodic, so the gray, the episodic sequences are more likely to produce low exceedance probability events. In other words, so the events that live down here up below exceedance probability of 0 0.2, they tend to be episodic rather than uh, diffuse, which is another obje interesting observation. Um, so sort of interlude before we go into part two of the talk um, is that we sort of have this unified catalog for all of Texas. We see this sort of range of behavior across the basins. Um, and then we have this interesting observation of the episodic versus diffuse in different basins, and then also how that relates to the exceedance probability. And so the next thing we're going to jump into is we're going to focus in on that uh, interesting area in west, in the West Delaware Basin to try and see if we can understand it a little bit better. Um, and so uh, the reason, so as I said, this region has had quite a number of larger earthquakes. So in fact, three uh, magnitude five or almost magnitude five earthquakes in the last three years. Um, so we have two events, two larger events in the Colson sequence, which is over here, and then one in the Mentone, um, and present day seismicity remains high. And so the current understanding um, of why there is seismicity in this region at all is that it is due to far field wastewater injection. So the purple circles are uh, deep wastewater injection to the north, so northern uh, so along the border of uh, New Mexico and Texas over here. And then we have a good number of shallow injection wells over here. And so what I what I want to really emphasize is that over the earthquakes, which are the orange circles, over the earthquakes, there is no hydraulic fracturing and there is uh, only a little bit of shallow wastewater disposal and there's no deep wastewater disposal, right? So in other words, all like the the injectors, as opposed to all the other regions, the injectors actually are are decently far away. There's nothing right on top of the seismicity. So we want to understand why this region in particular, so why the Culberson region in particular is so sensitive to far field injection, right? So that's so that's the mystery. Um, and so let's kind of like that we can look at the time series. There's been, you know, there's an enormous number of events over the last uh, five, six years. Um, and basically, in my mind, this region is likely to continue uh, to be active. Um, I'm going to show a, a time series of how the events progress, because then this will help us really understand what are the driving forces and, and how things are moving along. And so um, this map, it's about 40, uh, 40 kilometers across or, or like 30 miles, something like this. Um, and I'm going to step through in time in snapshots of a year or about six months. Um, and so we have some reference TextNet stations for, for scale. And then the location of this white cross is eventually where we have the largest event in the subregion, which is a magnitude 4.9. Um, and so as I step through the slides, what I want you guys to, to notice is that there's two key trends. One will be that there'll be migration from east to west. And then the second trend will be the reactivation over certain clusters over time. And so here we are now, we're in 2019, or up until 2019, we start to see the red events, 2020, start to see the orange, uh, the, the orange, the yellows. So we start to see zones where seismicity is repeated, right? So you have seismicity going on for years, um, 2021, 2022, again, but overall the progression is from east to west, right? With that reactivation over time. 
Um, now we're into 2023, and then we're all the way up until May 2023, right? So overall, you can see it migrates east-west and reactivating different key sequences as it does so. So how do we explain this? Um, is there more to it than just far field injection? Um, and so another thing we can look at is, again, those B values, right? So I've taken the two biggest clusters um, in this region, um, and I've plotted the B values over time, and we see some kind of interesting trends. So cluster one, which is the largest cluster, um, it's also newer, so that's the black line here, uh, the black line. It's newer, it, it's, it started later on. Um, its B values have been decreasing over the last uh, two years. And so if I had to bet, um, I would say that cluster one is the candidate of uh, future seismicity. Whereas cluster two, it was one of the oldest clusters um, that we saw. And so it's longer lived, it's stable, and the B values tend to be higher. That's the white dashed line. Um, however, both clusters, if you look at it, both of them are diffuse, right? So by the way that we classified it in the first half of the talk, um, both of these are very much uh, exhibiting diffuse seismicity, right? There's, there's no breaks. It's just kind of continuous over the last uh, three, four years. Um, and so this is pretty much as far, uh, so now that we, we understand how the seismicity progressed, now we can bring in some additional information um, to see if we can really understand what's going on in this region. And so um, one of the really interesting uh, things that CISR has been working with is uh, using INSAR um, or Interferometric Synthetic Aperture Radar um, in order to really understand um, the, the, the changes in the ground motion and the impact to injection and extraction um, in the Delaware Basin. Um, and so INSAR is a satellite-based technique that monitors changes to the Earth's surface, right? So basically you get maps where you have zones of uplift and then you have zones of subsidence. And those can be due to different, um, different causes, but in our case, it will be um, mainly, uh, well, we'll see in a minute, mainly uh, due to uh, movement on faults. And so um, there's, so Peter uh, Hennings published a really great paper on uh, the INSAR signature over the Delaware Basin, right? And so you see these enormous trends of, say, subsidence, those are the blues, and then uplifts, those are the orange. And so really the hydraulic fracturing and the wastewater injection and the withdrawal and everything in this basin um, has had a rather significant impact to the point where you can even see changes at the surface. Um, and so our focus area is over here. It's toward the edge of the Delaware Basin, right? Um, and so just from looking at it from this view, it looks overall like an uplift pattern. But if we take a closer look, there are some finer features there. Um, so for example, uh, this is the INSAR from 2022, and there's both uplift and subsidence, so it's red and blue. I'm gonna try and convince you guys that there are two dipole features that are evident. Um, I've labeled them S1 and U1 for dipole one and S2 and U2 for dipole two. Um, and so what's interesting is if I then plot the seismicity, right? And here's that cross again, where that largest event was. Um, if I plot the seismicity on top, the dipole features and where the bulk of the seismicity is happening um, coincide, right? Say they overlap. Um, and so I think they're, all, you know, quite naturally, they're inherently related. Um, but then the question becomes, when did this INSAR feature appear? And then later in the talk, we will discuss, well, what does this INSAR feature mean in this context, um, in this area? And so uh, what we're going to do is, again, we're going to kind of step through time. But this time, instead of looking through, looking at the seismicity, we're going to be looking at the INSAR signal in these like uh, two year snapshots. So if I go back to all the way to 2016, um, <clears throat> there's no indication of either dipole feature, right? So there's only just this broad uplift pattern, the red, um, but there's no dipole feature. If I go into 2018, now you see the colors have sort of uh, changed a little bit. You, you can see a hint of something starting at S1, subsidence area one. And so if I sort of toggle back and forth, you can see that. Um, and this coincides with the seismicity. So here's that cross, here it is here. If we look at th this cluster of seismicity, that will map really close to where S1 is located. Um, now, stepping forward again into 2020, now 
this the first dipole feature really starts to become um the really starts to become prominent now it's this blue um there's a little bit of increased red at u1 um and then even now s2 starts to become clear so there's this again just like the seismicity there's this east west um migration and then finally when we get to 2022 now you can really see uh both typo features uh taking shape and so um over time basically the peak of the the subsidence kind of migrates right um until now u2 becomes really uh this one until uh this this feature really becomes evident um, and so if we look at the cross sections of the INSAR, this also really helps to kind of make it clear. Um, and so A to A prime is dipole one. So it's this guy here. You can see the uplift and the subsidence, so classic dipole feature. Um, likewise with B to B prime, which is dipole two, um, the uplift is a little bit more subtle, but you can still see it. Um, and then the subsidence, of course, is very, very prominent. Um, and so one of the ways that that um, people who work with INSAR use this kind of data is, is they use it for modeling and uh, inversion. So in our case, we did some forward modeling um, to try and see, OK, what kind of fault geometry and at, at what depth does there need to be slip in the subsurface to produce the these dipole features that we're seeing? And so we used a really simple Okada 1985 dislocation model um to test this and so um but we had some really good prior information and so um Dino Huang from uh TexNet he has calculated lots of focal mechanisms um and moment tensors in this region and so from those we're able to to determine the strike of the fault right so the strike is about 110 degrees and the dip ranges from 50 to 70 degrees and so that is a priori information that we put into the model um, likewise, Lily Horn from Scissor, she has mapped some of the faults in this region as well. And so that really helps to confirm, um, in fact, that uh, the orientation and the dip, et cetera, are, are correct. Um, and then uh, just to emphasize, we're in a normal uh, faulting regime here. Um, so when we use when we do the modeling, the thing that we don't know is we don't know the depth of the fault, right? And so uh, even though we have a good handle on strike and dip and rake, um, uh, it's the depth that I was testing here. So this slide is showing sort of the differences in, in the depths. And here I was only trying to match this first dipole, right? So dipole one. Um, and so when you look at different depths and then you look at the scale of the deformation, which is about 10 kilometers, um, to, to a first order, we get a really good correspondence at a depth of about two kilometers or a depth of about um, four kilometers. But if we put the fault slip really deep, then we get these really large, broad um, uh, uplift and subsidence patterns, which is not uh, what we see in the actual data, right? So this gives us a sort of really approximate constraint of where we think the slip is happening in the subsurface, right? Um, and then if I try to fit <clears throat> both dipoles, <clears throat> what's interesting here is that you need two faults, right? Because two dipoles, two faults, but the faults dip in opposite directions, right? And so the way that you can kind of imagine this, it's it's potentially this sort of like mini grabbing structure, but not quite because it's, it's more like a step over with two opposite dipping directions, right? So... Um, I think more work needs to be done to really understand, like, does this make sense, you know, geologically, given, you know, given this region and all these things. But um, this is a, this is just what we're seeing from the INSAR. This is just kind of what uh, what comes out of that. Um, but and again, yeah, we can kind of see a pretty good first order correspondence to making this dipole feature um, to, to matching the dipole feature to the observed data. Um, <clears throat> and so what are the implications? Well, the INSAR modeling suggests that the fault slip is happening at about two to four kilometers depth, right? However, uh, the earthquake locations are at about six to eight kilometers depth, right? So here I've plotted a cross section of our study region with the earthquakes now in cross section view. And then here's a histogram um, of the depth distribution as well. Um, and so if we, so basically the earthquake locations are telling us that that the earthquakes are at the basin basement boundary or in the basement itself, right? So all the way down here. Whereas what the slip is telling us is that the slip is somewhere up here, right? So it's it's shallow instead of deep. And so here we, we have a little bit of trouble. We need to try and reconcile those two. And so, well, what do we think is happening? Um, one of the things 
I really want to point out is that the the slip that's happening it's it's a seismic slip right so it's not due to the earthquakes themselves that's a different signal right the earthquakes um, the earthquakes and the aseismic slip are two very different things. Um, and so to clarify, what is aseismic slip then? Aseismic slip is the release of stress on a fault without radiating, radiating seismic waves, right? So um, basically, if you, if, if you guys are familiar with sort of this A minus B and velocity weakening or velocity strengthening behavior, um, you get aseismic slip if the, the, um, the strata that you're dealing with is velocity strengthening. Whereas if you have um, material that's velocity weakening, that's when you get earthquakes. Now, where it gets a little bit complicated is that a single fault uh, feature, such as on a subduction zone or on a, on a fault in a basin, um, different parts of the fault may behave in different ways. So for example, if, if the fault really is quite long and quite deep and passes through many different types of formations, um, you, you may have some zones at which it prefers a seismic slip whereas in some zones it prefers seismic rupture. So one potential interpretation of the sort of um, depth discrepancy between the INSAR, which is indicating a seismic slip, and the earthquakes, which is indicating deeper seismicity, is that perhaps it's sort of inverted to this diagram here, right? So perhaps what we're having is a seismic slip at the top and then seismic rupture at the bottom, right? That could be one possible explanation. Um, but of course, more work needs to be done. This is something that that needs to be tested. Um, uh, yeah, that needs to be tested more. And so, well, why is a seismic slip a concern? Um, so in my study region in Canada, um, what we saw was where we had regions of a seismic slip, we had an increased probability of long-term seismicity even after injection had stopped. And so we had this, this really famous case study um, in the Duvernay Basin in Canada where we had some aseismic slip and basically the seismicity on this, on this particular fault feature continued for years, despite all the wells in the surrounding region being shut in and no production and no further injection, right? And so basically it's sort of like, I think of it as sort of this domino effect, right? Like once you've sort of touched this aseismic slip region, it, it just kind of creeps along for a while, triggering more and more earthquakes as it kind of, um, as it continues to slip, right? Um, and maybe that's what we're seeing in CMES, right? So, or in the West Delaware Basin, we have all this continued seismicity. There's a chance that it's a combination of both. Like, yes, we have the far field injection, right? That That's the driving factor. Um, but there's a chance that even if we stopped all of the injection, um, because already you have this proclivity for a seismic slip, you're going to have more long-lived seismicity than, than you otherwise would, right? So that, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, so in conclusion, um, statewide seismicity in Texas is a function both of injection style, wastewater injection versus hydraulic fracturing, um, and location within the basin. Um, and then in our interesting study region in West, uh, in the West Delaware Basin, we have this really interesting transient INSAR uh, signal accompanying seismicity that may be indicative of uh, a seismic slip. And so with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to take. Uh, any questions at this point? Thank you for the talk, Nadine. Uh, we have uh, two questions in the chat. And uh, Jay Book, uh, if you'd like to ask in person, otherwise I'm happy to read it. Oh, may I read it? Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Nadine. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, uh, yeah, I uh, like the intensity of human activities like fluid injection. I uh, I think uh, geological factors like uh, rock stiffness uh, may pre uh, primarily uh, influence the variance uh, in seismogenic responses across the uh, different basins in Texas. Uh, each basin has unique geologic features that react differently to external stimuli. Uh, so do you have any insights on uh, consider considering the differences in geological factors to analyze uh, seismogenic responses in different basins? 
That's right. That's an excellent question. Yeah. So really, um, this work, uh, the work that I've done now really is sort of uh, where uh, it, it, it's like the, the tip of the iceberg, right? So I, I've done an analysis mainly focusing on the seismology, right? And I haven't gone into, you're right, you're exactly right, the vast differences in the geological characteristics of these different basins, right? So I've sort of, I've, I've, kind of glossed over that, but they are very different. So there's different depths, there's different pressures, there's different, um, some zones are overpressured, some zones are not, right? That makes a big, pretty big difference. Um, and then the geomechanical differences, I think are are what makes some region, like that's what makes some regions prone, say to a seismic slip and some not, right? Um, and then exactly, you said it as well, stiffness, right? So if the rock is really brittle, um, you're you're mostly gonna get just seismicity. You're not gonna get a seismic slip, right? Um, and so on for, for considering the different geologic factors, like that really is a work that needs to be done. Like that that's an enormous undertaking, right? So that's a work that needs to be done with like a whole host of, you know, really experienced geologists that can, you know, bring that to the table and then integrate that. So I hope someday we can get there. Um, and similar work has been done in other basins, right? So in, in Canada, we um, the group that I worked with there, we we worked a lot with geologists to really understand, like, okay, what what is the rock formation? What is what are its properties? And what are we missing here as seismologists, right? Um, so yeah, you brought up a very important point. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have another question from Alex Sun. Again, Alex, if you would like to ask it out loud, otherwise I'm happy to read it. Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, this is a basically, a, a, I mean, basic time series question. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's kind of long, but uh, I, I, I was wondering uh, whether you care about the uh, correlation uh, in the e events sequence, because like, you know, as, as you show in many of your slides, uh, many of the events happen, for example, on the same day, right? So mm -hmm. I would think uh, those events are uh, were uh, you know caused by the same uh, mechanism. So mm -hmm. if you included all those uh, events from the same sequence, I mean, would that you know dilute your uh, analysis? I mean, uh, b because I, I'm not sure if that's the issue in uh, seismology because. In hydrology, we typically uh, uh, apply a moving window to uh, sort of uh, uh, ensure the uh, independence of uh, different events. So yeah, so it's just a you know basic time series question. Right, that's actually a really good question. So in seismology, we do have something like that. It's called declustering. Um, yeah. And so let's say uh, you're looking at, like, let's say you want to understand the background seismicity rates. And so typically that you would do this in a region of, of natural seismicity. Um, and you want to understand the, the, yeah, the, the background seismicity rates. You want to remove those main shock, aftershock type sequences, because you're right, it, it biases your B values and all these other things. Um, and so that's a different type of analysis, right? So that's looking at um, natural rates of seismicity. Whereas here in the induced seismicity world, declustering is really diff difficult. So if I declustered all of my episodic, um, let, let's say all of the clusters that were episodic, I would have nothing left, right? <laughs> there would be nothing in between. Um, and then uh, also, you know, we're really dealing with uh, constraints in the catalog size, right? So I have tens of thousands of events, which sounds like a lot, but if you decluster, you will be left with really just a minority of events. And if you have very few events, you cannot accurately, accurately calculate any statistical attributes of any kind, right? So, so that that's kind of like a like a like a sort of a subtle point in seismology. We do declustering, but not for the purpose of of the type of work that I'm doing here. Okay, thanks. Oh, uh, I have a question, but one more person asked a question in chat just now. Uh, it's from Julia Gale. Uh, Julia, would you like to ask? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, you, before you went into all your dipoles, you suggested that um, because there was no injection activity or hydraulic fracturing out to the west where they are, that yes. people had surmised that there might be a cause due to far field injection to the north. And so um, 
do you still think that's a one plausible um, possibility? Because if so, it begs a lot of questions and I've just lost my chat window here. Oh, sorry. Because <laughs> yeah, I, I had written it down and I was kind of reading for it. Uh, okay. Um, and so where are we? Yeah, there's a lot of questions on, uh, for example, why would you get activity on those fault out in Culberson, why isn't there um, more activity on the central basin platform? Maybe the faults are completely different. And allied to that, kind of related to that, is um, what is the movement on the faults in your dipoles? It looks uh, just intuitively like it would be normal, mm. um, and they're normal, they're normal faults in in geometry, um, but I. I know you mentioned that um, Dino had done some Fort Payne's plane solution analysis. So can you kind of just speak to a little bit about what do you think is happening on those faults? Um, bearing in mind that you're you're talking about a mix of shallow to deep activity. Yes. Yes, that's right. Actually, that that's an excellent uh that that's yeah, that's an excellent um cool question um so why the activity is happening on these specific faults that that frankly that's that's still in my mind that's still a big question um mm -hmm. in the field and so there's sort of two two hypotheses so one hypothesis one is that there are no optimally oriented faults over the regions of deep say like so if we look at the purple region right where the purple like the deep injection wells hypothesis one is okay well there's no optimally oriented faults that are critically stressed so that even when you're injecting really close there's nothing to slip right so you have this sort of wasteland of, of very few faults that's one possibility right it, i don't i don't know that but that's one possibility and then the second possibility the other end member is that the poor pressures are are traveling in a way such that they avoid all the optimally oriented features that are in say in New Mexico or over the central basin platform right so one of the things i kind of alluded to with my like i kept emphasizing east west migration east west migration one of the things i alluded to is i think we have these sort of um high pressure high permeability pathways that exist in the subsurface that allow this really far field injection to kind of like, you know, blast across, you know, dozens of miles and, and reach these critically stressed faults. Um, and so, yeah, that that's kind of my understanding of that, right? And so that also explains why there's not much activity in the central basin platform is because of that um, preferential orientation of the fractures and the sort of the way that the poor, like the poor pressure perturbation travels, it travels east to west for whatever reason travels east to west um and so that's why in this case the central basin platform is untouched um does that kind of make sense oh and then dino's focal mechanisms were they were normal like yeah he 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 concluded that these are all normal normal faults yeah um, okay thank you yeah it's it's hard i know <laughs> but thanks Okay, I, it sounds like I missed the question in the chat. Uh, we have a question from Alex. Um, apparently he is on his workstation and does not have microphone. Um, Alex says, nice talk. Uh, he's intrigued by the far field events that you showed. Um, it looks like the injection was triggering seismicity 15 plus miles away from the wells. Uh, Alex's question is, can you actually demonstrate cause and effect? And do you have any pressure measurements at the faults or indication of the magnitude of pressure increase at the faults? Right. That's right. Well, yeah. So this is this is work. Um, so Scissor has been quite involved um, in this type of work, um, as have the companies uh, that that work in this region. Of course, they're very interested in this. But we do. So the comp the companies uh, have the what did you call it? Uh, yeah, the direct, you know, the demonstrable direct evidence. Um, and so what some of the operators did was they deployed pressure uh, pressure sensors. Um, I, if, if I remember correctly, like somewhere around here, somewhere around Culberson, but closer to the north. Um, and then basically they could watch the poor pressure perturbation travel from north to south, right? So there there is evidence of also a north to south Um you know, increase in pore pressure. And they saw really like, I would say rather large 
pore pressure changes, you know, on a seismological scale, rather large um, pore pressure changes in relatively short periods um, of time. Um, and so Scissor uh, now also has access to this data. And so they're working on incorporating this into their models and trying to understand how this like matches with the, the fault structure and their understanding of, of the sort of um, the basin architecture and geometry and stuff like that. So um, in my mind, a lot more work needs to be done to really reconcile these observations, right? Um, but we're getting there. So I, I have to say like, I, I'm pretty convinced that it's real, right? Because I've I've seen the sort of the the products of like them, I've seen the pressure data, right? So it's, it looks really real. But the problem is we don't our understanding of the physical mechanisms, and then also repeated testing just to validate these observations um, is still lacking. Um, Nadine, this is Katie Smy. I'm here. Um, I just want to hey. echo. Yeah, yeah. Do you mind if I jump in? Please, please go ahead. <laughs> Your answer was great. That's spot on. But um, yeah, just to echo Alex's question. I mean, this is a conundrum. This area and Julia's question as well. You know, this is one of the most seismically active areas in the the U.S. mid continent, and is kind of. There's a major uh, basement suture zone here. The Grenville Front runs right through this area, so these faults seem to be extremely sensitive. But this far field triggering is a conundrum. So JP Nico's group, and I think JP's on here too, the regional pore pressure modeling we've done doesn't show a pore pressure increase that's high enough to push those faults to slip, given what how we currently understand those faults. Um, and what we are doing now, as Nadine says, is using some of this pressure data from companies who do show that they're not on the fault. The pressure monitoring data is on wells that have been uh, monitored or shut in proximal to this seismic region. In fact, this whole region, um, just a couple of weeks ago, um, all permits in this region for deep injection were suspended. So this is actually like a, an emergency now for the Permian Basin region. But this far field triggering does seem to be just related to really high diffusivities, fracture dominated flow. Um, the diffusivities are probably orders of magnitude higher locally than we are showing in our regional models. So there's a lot of work left to do, as Nadine says. Thank you, Katie. That that really helped. <laughs> sure. um, the chat is quiet. And if other people are still thinking, I, I do have two questions. Uh, the first one is when you were showing in your earlier slides um, uh, with the basins and the earthquakes, I noticed that some of the earthquakes uh, on the central basin platform you have allocated to Delaware Basin and some you allocated to Midland Basin. I was wondering how you made that cutoff or why didn't you have central basin platform as its own cluster? Right, that, that's that's a good question actually. Um, yeah, so so the so some of these older, um, that, that's actually a really good question. So some of these clusters over here um, on the central basin platform, these are really, uh really old events like so well by really old i mean like pre-2015 um and uh yeah so you're right technically these should be classified as something else because some of them even are not um some of them even are, are due to like conventional uh, oil and gas activity not unconventional like the rest of this um so you're right technically technically that isn't quite right and then these clusters I don't remember if if we have clear attribution for these as well but uh but no you're right actually I shouldn't like to simplify it I I tend to just split into Midland and Delaware but but you're right there's a lot more uh uh yeah uh to, to be fully properly correct there should also be only central basic platform events separately yeah thank you um any any other questions? Oh, Sue Haworka asked the question. Um, Sue, would you like to ask it or would you like me to read it? I'm gonna read it. Sue asks, do you have depths on the Culberson far from injection events? Seems like the 3D plumbing may be important in focusing flow. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, so the depths were here. Um, and so the trouble with the, the earthquake depths is that they're about six to eight kilometers, right? So, so that would put it, you know, down here somewhere, right? So at the basin basement interface or somewhere over here. Um, but the trouble is that the, the monitoring network in that region 
um, is still kind of still kind of being improved. Like it's gotten a lot better. So the depths have, I, I'd like to think that the depths have improved, but to be honest, the station separation is still quite large. And so, um, and also it's still very sensitive to velocity models. So if you, like as a seismologist, if I mess with the parameters a little bit, um, or I try a more complex relocation algorithm, the depths of the earthquake shift upwards quite a bit, right? So <clears throat> what I'm seeing is that um, the, yeah, in fact, the seismicity might be in the basin rather than the basement, right? Which really, which really matters in this case, right? Because are we dealing with basement plumbing, right? Or are we dealing with basin fractures, whatever, right? Um, and so to kind of solve this, one of the things that I'm going to do um, while I'm here at UT Dallas, as I continue this work, is we're, we're planning on deploying a few nodal arrays in West Texas so we can really like so we can have these really small station separations and then we can really pin down the depths over some of these faults um, to really confirm okay is it really six to eight kilometers or is it more like three to five kilometers right yeah so that that's work in progress um, i have one one question nadine katie so i hope that's okay related to sue's question can you learn anything about the 3d plumbing by looking at evolution of earthquake sequences do they get deeper throughout time and and as they migrate i mean does that tell us something about how um, fluids or pressures are migrating along those faults absolutely yeah so the work that i did in in canada we had really high resolution like local data that we were able to we were even able to back out like permeabilities of the fractures that we were dealing with right um and absolutely you see the migration you see it like like in, in that particular data set, we saw the earthquakes kind of like hit, a, like, um, you know, enter a new geomechanical zone and then like go this way and they go down. Like we saw all these really amazing, like we, you could kind of see the, the fluid flow in effect, right? Um, but the trouble is you need very high resolution data to do that. And you cannot get that with a regional network. Um, and so that's why we really, that's where we're really hoping to go out and, and deploy these nodal, uh, nodal arrays um, to, to get that kind of quality data to see if we can dig that out of, of the seismicity. Cool, oh, thanks. I have one quick last thing that relates to what you were just saying and Sue's question, which is you when you put up that slide where you showed the depths, um, you talked about the possible depth location error um, due to the, the network itself and then also the velocity model. What about errors on the INSAR um, modeling inversion for the depth? Because that intuitively, that also would be a subject to some error. Absolutely. Yeah. So to kind of, <laughs> yeah, that, that's an excellent question also. Um, so I've been working with Ann Chen, um, uh, to, you know, to make sure that the modeling I'm doing is good. I also have an, an INSAR expert in-house um, in, in my department at UT Dallas. She's also a new hire. Um, and so she's also helping me to kind of validate and make sure I'm using the right software and the right models and the right geometry, all these things. So uh, yes, we're definitely, we're trying to pin down the uncertainty on that as well. Yeah, and then Alex has just um, hopped in. I'll, I'll read it since he doesn't have a mic. Um, he he says, could you use the velocity models developed for reflection seismic to better constrain the um, earthquake depths? There's a lot of data that goes into those models, especially here. That's right. And so TextNet, so that, that's TextNet's domain. And so TextNet, along with uh, Robin Damase, that has been an enormous uh, undertaking on their end. So we have 3D seismic data, we have 2D seismic lines, we have well logs, we have everything you could possibly want. Um, but the trouble is that the the well, con like the, there's very little seismic data in the cement, like in that West Texas region, um, including 3D seismic. Like in one of the regions, there's no 3D seismic of any kind. Um, and so there we're having quite a bit of trouble pinning down the, like a, a proper, you know, really accurate velocity model. So also a work in progress, yeah. All right, everyone. Well, thank you, Nadine, for giving this talk. This was really instructive. Um, and Vera, time. If anyone have uh, has more questions, please reach out to the speaker. And uh, thank you for attending. All right. Thank Thanks, you, Nadine. Everyone. Bye. Thank you.